Hey, Alistair here, and I'll just update you on the biodiversity of magic mushrooms in Australia with some of the new results of where uh, Psilocybe cubensis might have come from and some stuff on mating as usual and just how the collection is going in general. Last week, I gave a talk for Queensland Health, uh, this Q Health and the Queensland Police Service on natural drugs and toxins in Australia. So it was a huge seminar day. I'm going to, if they share a link, I'll, it was recorded, I'll put it on the blog and I recommend checking out uh, one of the talks. There was a talk on DMT and the criminal use in Australia, uh, especially illegal production, which I just found fascinating and I think the community of entheogenesis will find it pretty interesting too. So check it out if you've got a spare 10. Okay, and it's sub-season, so go ahead chuck up a few photos of subs. These ones were collected possibly in a new location for Queensland in a national park with park rangers and indigenous rangers. And I was hoping the indigenous rangers would know what they were because it would make our job linking psilocybe sub use of psilocybe subaruginosa with indigenous people much easier. But I think we're going to have our work cut out for us, but I'm, I'm sure that we're up for it. Thanks to everyone who's been sending me photos of subs as well. I just really enjoy seeing the phenotypic variation from all across the East Coast. Wonderful. I just wanted to illustrate uh, the spore rate, the spore drop, or the uh, how prolific cubes are when they're dropping spores. So this has just been here for 10 minutes and it's already left this massive load at the back of this paper here. So millions of spores and then the same here just in this 10 minutes. I say that uh, they drop at 2,000 per minute, and that's just extrapolating from knowledge of other Basidia mycota. Uh, we could probably measure it with a hemocytometer if, if the community desperately wanted to know how many spores were getting produced per minute. I've got the required equipment to do that. Let me know. <laughs> um, while we're on spores, Psilocybe cubensis on the right, Psilocybe subaruginosa on the left, so chalk and cheese. Kane's been sending me, th these are from Queensland, Kane's been sending me some from Tasmania. And so these two really far apart populations, the spore morphology is unrecognizable. Mycologists often use spores, they go fall back to spore differences when they're trying to differentiate species if there isn't any phenotypic variation in the mushroom itself. So these were pretty, uh, pretty uniform from Queensland to Tasmania. Interesting. The collection so far, so cubes, the season's just come to an end. Um, at the end of one, you know, one season, I had over 50. Unfortunately, I had a little bit of a mite problem, so it's dropped back down to 48. But I'm not too worried. I think I can revisit the populations that I lost pretty easily. Thanks to people from Entheogenesis, Matt W, Bocky and Dan, um, Andy from Ballina, it's just been fantastic to receive samples of cubes from you and you've really helped contribute to how how wide across Australia we can do our sampling. Um, I've sequenced three genomes and two weeks ago I submitted 32 for more genomic sequencing. And this may be enough to resolve uh, the genetic diversity of Psilocybe cubensis in Australia. I expect there to be low genetic diversity and if there is low genetic diversity, then probably we don't need to keep sampling. Now, I've been wrong with every hypothesis I've ever made about psilocybe, so it's, who knows, there could be high genetic diversity, in which case we'd have to keep sampling. With subaruginosa, the season now, so thanks to Kane, thanks to Dave from Kosciuszko, uh, we've got three populations from Queensland, plus more populations coming from Tassie, Victoria, and New South Wales, uh, I expect we'll end up with probably more than 50 haploid cultures by the end of this season. And I'll do my best to get all those genomes sequenced before my contract finishes. Okay, I've put this up for a couple of reasons. I just am really mindful that uh, phylogenetic trees are probably a little bit easier, uh, sorry, more intuitive to interpret. And that's just the way that Darwin had first illustrated them you know, the way he intended evolution, that dichotomous hypothesis with easy branching. These are splits trees. And in a splits tree, 
Uh, it's putting down every kind of way, different tips. So at the end of each of these little branches is a tip. Every way the data between those tips can be related to each other. So it's kind of the best of everything. This is the way you can visualize all the relationships among data. I, I love them. When you see reticulation, it's often a sign of recombination, sexual reproduction, or in this case, probably in the ITS region, it's like, oh, geez, it's, it's a bit hard to explain this area. We don't know what exactly is going on. We know that cubes and subs at some point had a most recent common ancestor along with this group, whatever this is under my dome. So what we see here, and you've always hear me refer to subs as subs, even though there's heaps of names to apply to them, including more like Eucalypta, Australiana, Tasmaniensis. Uh, I can't remember the names. In fact, I think I might have just said them wrong then. What we're doing in this study with all these genomes is finding structure. And structure is just whether different populations are sexual, uh, having sex. So if they're not, then there's evidence that maybe they're separated from each other over time, whether it's because they're in a different geographical region or there's a boundary like a, a flipping bass strait or they're on island populations like in Queensland. Uh, and then we can look to apply names retrospectively based on what we know about the population structure. And we'll eventually be able to do that with Psilocybe cubensis as well as we get more data from all over the world and look at how populations have been shaped. So that's the reason I call everything in Australia a psilocybe subaruginosa. It's, I'm aware that there's lots of different names, but let's find how we can apply those names first based on population structure. So recently, the psilocybe cubensis community had this massive injection of data from this group, Psilocydia, who sequenced the genomes of every single commercially available um, line of Psilocybe cubensis, and they sequenced it from spore prints. So each spore print has millions of haplotypes of different spores. So each spore has a different genotype, essentially. Uh, so it's a crazy data set, but we can still use it um, to look at genetic diversity. So I've popped in our three genomes from Australia, which are under my dome, and I don't know how to move me. Um, I've popped in our three genomes with the 80 or so from Psilocydia. And so if we treat Psilocydia, this genomic resource, as a pretty good representation of all of the, so all the cubes under cultivation, essentially, then our ones from Australia are not related to anything under cultivation that's commercially available. Pretty cool, huh? So branch length in these split trees is informative. It's reflective of genetic diversity. So our ones in Australia are that far distant, like this is a really long branch. They're really different from everything else. And then ours are also on their own long branches, which kind of shows that, um, you can look at the real figure of this on my blog. It kind of shows that there's more genetic diversity just in three genomes from Australia than in all of Golden Teacher, or this is PNV down here. So we're sitting on a fair bit of genetic diversity in Australia, and it's unlike everything that's under cultivation in the United States. Pretty cool. When you look at, um, this is Golden Teacher, so this is just the population. So remember, reticulation is sexual reproduction. If we saw reticulation at the ends of these tips, we'd know that they're outcrossing with each other. When we've got these tips on long branches, it's kind of an indication of something else. And because we know that the city of Mycota have to reproduce sexually to form a mushroom, I would interpret this as inbreeding. So long branches, but not reticulation at the ends of those branches. So similar genotypes are the probably, rather than the result of sexual reproduction, they're the result of inbreeding, which it's a form of sexual reproduction, but from a low, uh, low genetic starting point. Um, if we saw the population of Psilocybe subaruginosa, or when we do, it'll put it into context, I hope. Okay, so from all this cube, from these cube genomes, I think we're in a pretty good position to say that Psilocybe cubensis, the natural populations, at least from New South Wales and all the way up to far north Queensland, 
they're not introduced from commercial cultivation because they're just completely different to everything that, that is commercially available. So it's probably they were introduced before anyone started, um, started cultivating Psilocybe cubensis. That's my guess um, based on what we've just seen. Okay, and just a little bit on mating. So mating and not mating here. <laughs> and from six genomes of Psilocybe subaruginosa, six different genomes, I was able to say, okay, well, I know which of my cultures are going to cross. Eight can potentially cross with everything because it's different at the HD loci. Um, homeo domain one, homeo domain two, and all of these technically shouldn't cross because they all have the same allele at those two homeo domain genes. Then the pheromone receptor genes, well, maybe eight can cross with everything except for two and four and seven, where they each share an allele of a pheromone receptor. So eight definitely should be able to cross with five and six because five and six doesn't share a pheromone gene with eight. What I essentially saw, and this took a couple of weeks because because I didn't know what was going on for so long. What I saw was, so I, this is eight times six and there's this massive gap down the middle and I'm like, oh man, they're not reproducing, but five and six are, and five and six shouldn't cross. It turns out that this is confluence and this there is an interaction zone going on here. So we had mating between eight and two, eight and six, eight and five, and eight and four. So eight and seven didn't cross which means that that one pheromone receptor is controlling mate compatibility. And the reason that I knew that something like this had crossed is because of these little clamp connections that maintain nuclear fidelity. If you remember this image, I've always been talking about the haploid, haplotype of a, of a single basidiospore. Well, now these are little clamp connections. So when the hyphae, produce, uh, hyphae grow, the nuclei migrate one nucleus goes with the hyphae and then the other one migrates later. And this is what they look like when you see them down a microscope. So to see clamp connections means that you've got a dicaryotic hyphae and that there has been sexual reproduction. Pretty cool, huh? So five and six and eight times seven didn't have these. Thank you everyone who sent me specimens. Uh, it's really, we're, we're easily gonna crack 100 before uh, one year of the project pretty much. Um, thanks to Dave H, to, to Kane, especially for these subs that are coming in at the moment. Okay, everything's put on the blog. I'll see if I can put that Q Health seminar on the blog if they send it to me and check out that DMT talk if you've got time. Otherwise, that's it from me. Hopefully I'll see you down in Melbourne uh, at the end of the year. Bye for now.